I became beautiful when I became a feminist. Up to then, I was a pretty girl. I was not beautiful. The face of feminism, Gloria Steinem, believes that a woman's battle wages on. Women are trying to get out of the pink collar ghetto into the white collar ghetto. A blue collar union job for a man still pays more than either one. Steinem, known for breaking down walls, has expanded her message beyond women's liberation to address other social injustices. The activist recently turned 80, but refuses to let age slow her down or stop her from advancing the fight for equality. They keep saying the movement is over as a way of getting rid of us. Steinem was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, a medal she says for the entire women's movement. It's a movement she reflected on with us in her apartment in New York City. You turned 80 this year. The New York Times had an image of you with the headline, this is what 80 looks like. And I think that headline has pretty much followed you every decade it has. Um, for the last three decades. In fact, in I don't know if you remember this, but on your 70th, you said, quote, this one has the ring of mortality. <laughs> so is 80 terrifying? Yes, it is in a lot of ways. For me, 50 meant the end of the center of life, which for women has more significance since we have been wrongly valued only for childbearing. So 50 was difficult. 60 was great, you know, because that was like entering a new free country where you didn't have all these feminine expectations. And 70 was pretty good too. Uh, but 80 is definitely about mortality, because every day I see in the newspaper people, sometimes people I know, who have died before 80. Now, I plan to live to 100, <laughs> but even if I do, that's only 20 years. And if I think of something that happened 20 years ago, it seems like yesterday. When I talk to women and what they think about when they think of Gloria Steinem, they think unapologetic about her views but also glamorous and accessible. Is that how you see your legacy, as making feminism less threatening, in a way? I hope not, because I would like it to be threatening. There's a lot that deserves <laughs> threatening. Uh, you know, we come to this with whatever, whoever we are, right? I just hope that whatever it is I am is useful to the larger, huge uh, movement that, that this is. But I also think people have a funny view of them because they kind of secretly think if you could get a man, you wouldn't need equal pay. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, here's how I learned that. I became beautiful when I became a feminist. Up to then, I was a pretty girl. I was not beautiful. But in contrast to what people thought a feminist looked like, I suddenly became better looking. So I realized that there was something biased here. In, in the beginning of the life of any movement, it's very important to speak out, self-identify, be visible, be autonomous, be independent since you've been dependent. Then the next stage is interdependence. And I think the women's movement and most of our related movements are coming into the interdependent stage, so we see the linkage. And I hope that no more will we think of women's issues as a silo over here, is as if they don't affect absolutely everything. You said before that the feminist revolution would take about 100 years. So by that estimate, we're about at the halfway mark. There are clear gains, at least here in this country. Women make up about half the workforce. Uh, women tend to earn more college and advanced degrees. Uh, they're increasingly the breadwinners. Do you think feminists are still needed? Let me just take what you just said, okay? Yes, there are more women on campus than there are men by a little bit right now. Why is that? It's because women are trying to get out of the pink collar ghetto into the white collar ghetto. A blue collar union job for a man still pays more than either one. What's a pink collared ghetto? What does that mean? That a service job, a waitressing, healthcare, they're kind of all the jobs that we can't outsource because they involve personal service. Mm. And those are very, very, very disproportionately female. Also, now her situation is worse than in my day as an individual because she's more likely to graduate in big debt and she will make one or two million dollars less over her lifetime to pay back the debt. 
So, you know, I'm not trying to be discouraging. I'm just trying to say this is real life, you know, and, and uh, we, we need, uh, we don't even have equal pay. Why don't you take ownership at least of some of the gains? Oh, I do. Okay. I do, because but if, you, but if you're When you dig me... deeper into the statistics, right, mm -hmm. women in their 20s who start out are actually, according to the Pew Research Center, making closer to like 93 cents to the dollar, which is closer uh, than they ever have before. So there are these gains, mm -hmm. and I think some wonder, you know, why don't women like you who worked so hard in this movement take a step back and just appreciate that for a while, dwell well, on the positive? Well, well, I think mainly we don't because they keep saying the movement is over as a way of getting rid of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, it, they're, they're earning that in their 20s because they don't yet have children. Having children is a socially useful event. Also, we need to think not only uh, about equal pay, we need to think about um, pay for the work of caregiving that is 90% done by women. And it has no economic value whatsoever. Now, you, you know, we need to have a, a tax policy that attributes a value to that work, whether it's done by men or women, at replacement level. And that's deductible if you pay taxes and refundable if you don't. Right now, a third of the work in the country which is caregiving work, is done 90 or more percent by women and not rewarded at all. It's not even called a job. I mean, homemakers are still called women who don't work, excuse me. They work harder than anybody. <laughs> Have enough men adjusted to the realities of the women's movement, or has it led to men feeling displaced and confused about their role in society today? Well, you know, I don't want to speak about men as a lump, just as I don't want to speak about women as a lump. So some men have completely understood that it's their liberation too, that the masculine role is ridiculous, just like the feminine role is ridiculous, and, and dehumanizing, and keeps you from expressing all your human qualities. So they, they are feminists for their own sake, as well as for women's sake. And they say, wait a minute, I want to see my kids. I want policies of in the workplace that let everybody be parents, men as well as women. I want to have an equal relationship and a partnership, you know, with a, with a female or a male human being, but I, you know, I don't want to be lonely. I don't want to be isolated. There was a baseball player recently, a guy named Daniel Murphy, whose wife had a baby and he decided to take a couple days off so that he could be on paternity leave. And he faced a big backlash um, among other athletes. Is it at the point where men sort of need a liberation movement too? Well, they always needed a liberation. I mean, it's sort of, it's, it's racially comparable. I mean, I, I came back from India, you know, when I was 24 or something like that. And because I'd been living in India, I suddenly realized how segregated this country was, just visually. And I got mad on my own behalf, you know, who's telling me who my friends are and where I can live and so and I think when men get mad on their behalf and say, you know, but I, I want to be there when my child is born, it's an irreplaceable moment. Actually, I was glad to see that the one sports commentator who most criticized uh, was most condemned. It seems that some women feel suffocated by the amount of choices they have now, what Anne-Marie Slaughter calls unresolvable tensions between family and career. Was this an unintended consequence of feminism? No, it's an intended consequence of anti-feminism <laughs> because the point of feminism is uh, humanity. So what that means is that men can, should, and must really become parents who spend as much time with kids as women do. And that question presupposes that that's impossible. Does it also presuppose that we're just not there yet, that there aren't enough men uh, that are willing to take on those responsibilities at home? Uh, uh, yeah, there, you know, we certainly are in a state of flux, but more of us are saying, I'm not going to have children with someone who doesn't love them enough to be with them. And I'm not going to take a job that doesn't have decent parental leave for both men and women, or I'm going to organize where I am, whether I'm a man or a woman, to get that. In I mean, right now, we, we in this country work a more obsessive uh, work week than any country in the world. We used to be defeated by Japan. Right. Now we're worse than Japan. 
So we need to rebel. People deserve to have a life. You don't just, <laughs> if you're earning a living, you deserve a living. Coming up, Gloria Steinem talks about gay unions and anti-abortion legislation. More with Gloria Steinem in a minute. Only on Al Jazeera America. I live that character. Go one-on-one -on -one with America's movers and shakers. We will be able to see change. Gripping, inspiring, entertaining. <laughs> no topic off limits. I'm like, Dad, there are hookers in this house. <laughs> Exclusive conversations you won't find anywhere else. These are very vivid human stories. If you have an agenda with people, you sometimes don't see the truth. To watch new episodes of Talk to Al Jazeera, check your local listings or visit aljazeera.com. I'm Stephanie Sai. This is Talk to Al Jazeera. Our guest, Gloria Steinem, a feminist icon. So let's talk about first world problems versus third world pro problems. We've talked about the pay gap and other issues. Um, and yet there are places where women are still being stoned for adultery. There are places where women can't leave the house without a man, where they're sentenced to gang rape and honor killings. In places that that is happening, what is at the root, do you think, of what is working mm -hmm. against women? You know, I think we, we share the root and it takes different forms. Uh, and the root is controlling reproduction. If you want to control reproduction, you have to control women's bodies. If you want to determine paternity and ownership of children and so on, you have to uh, restrict the, the freedom of women. Is that a biological instinct that No, men of course have? not. No, no, no. So, it, so is it cultural? Yes. I mean, it wasn't, as far as we know, it wasn't like that for 95% of human history until patriarchy arrived on the scene via Europe and so on. It, it, uh, and it's exa greatly increased by racism or caste or class because if you, if you have a, a race you want to keep pure, quote unquote, and keep on the top, then you have to doubly control who women have children with. So the women of the so-called superior group are restricted and the women of the so-called inferior groups are exploited in order to produce cheap labor. But both are suffering from a lack of ability to control their own bodies and decide when and whether to have children. So you've worked in some of those communities. You've worked in Africa. I understand you've done some work in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. How do you cater the message of women's liberation in places like that? I listen. <laughs> the women there are doing it. You know, I mean, it's not up to me because, because they are experiencing it there. So it's up to us to, to support each other. We all experience it in different ways. For instance, domestic violence here is huge. I believe it's bigger than in any modern democracy in the world. And if you, if you added up all the women who've been murdered by their husbands or boyfriends since 9-11 as a period of time, then you add up all the Americans killed in 9-11, Afghanistan and Iraq, many more women have been murdered by their husbands and boyfriends than that figure. Violence against women is really cross-cultural, and it is at staggering levels. Adults worldwide have deliberately strangled or aborted 160 million infant girls or female fetuses because they wanted a boy. 100,000 girls in the United States were sold into sexual slavery. Mm -hmm. Why is violence against women cross-cultural if you're saying it doesn't have a biological root? Mm -hmm. why, is, why does it seem to be everywhere? Well, first of all, it's not absolutely everywhere. I mean, there are some matrilineal cultures that we can see, and we are coming out of it in various ways. But patriarchy is a political system, just like colonialism was a political system. That was everywhere, too. Racism, I mean, you know, it, 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 the justification for the colonization of Africa and North and South America and so on was, was profound racism that people could not... Um, adapt to the future. You were almost doing them a favor, you know, to eliminate them. What role does religion have in it? Usually bad, right. I mean, you know, not always. But Can you expand on that? Well, because, because uh, I mean, I'm differentiating religion and spirituality when I say that. But um, what happened uh, 
historically seems to be that the original spiritual systems in which God was seen as all living things gradually changed. So God was withdrawn from nature to make it okay to conquer nature and withdrawn from women to make it okay to conquer women. So in other words, God became used as a method to control. Well, God, God looked suspiciously like the ruling class. I mean, how come? And also happened to always be um, depicted as a man. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. He looked like he. I mean, Jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes in the middle of the Middle East, please. <laughs> so didn't resonate with you. No. <laughs> and yet there are billions of people that are religious. I want to talk about Pope Francis because you and he actually have a couple issues in common: um, immigration reform, human trafficking, um, poverty. Do you have any hope that women will be less marginalized in the church and beyond mm -hmm. under Pope Francis? You know, I want for women whatever they want for themselves. Some women want to go into the church and reform it. Some women want to leave the church. And so, you, you know, I mean, we all have to figure out what is the most uh, right for us and the most comfortable. But when the Pope uh, sees to it that the Catholic Church pays taxes everywhere, uh, you know, it's, I mean, right now they have parking lots they're not paying taxes on. They're impoverishing uh, the cities and countries they're in, you know, by, by not paying taxes. Um, the, the, the ceremonies are, are not equal. The uh, women can't become priests. Uh, women are denied reproductive freedom, which happens to be the single most important determinant of whether we're healthy or not, educated or not, in the workforce or not, and how long we live. And he's still denying that. It's been more than 40 years since Roe v. Wade. Abortion rights continue to be fought over. And between 2011 and 2013, more than 200 laws restricting abortion at the state level were introduced. What is driving the latest push toward anti-abortion legislation? Mm -hmm. The failure at the federal level to get a constitutional amendment against abortion or to really uh, curb abortion has caused the anti-abortion forces to focus on state legislatures that are controlled by conservative forces. And, and instead of murdering abortion doctors, which they did, uh, you know, eight or nine times and, you know, picketing and so on, they're now trying to do away with clinics by getting the state legislatures to impose impossible uh, restrictions and building requirements on, on clinics. They have long ago lost public opinion and actual real life. I mean, one in three American women chooses needs to have an abortion at some time in her life. So the question is, will she be safe or not? So there are these two interesting core issues that continue to be political flashpoints. One is the issue of gay marriage and gay rights in which the country and the Supreme Court seems very clearly to be favoring those rights for gay unions. On the other hand, uh, you see, at least at the state level, uh, courts moving in some cases to reintroduce restrictions on abortion. How do you square uh, those two issues from a societal perspective? Well, there's, I agree that they're related because the same forces that oppose uh, contraception, family planning, abortion, usually oppose uh, same-sex relationships too because they're basically opposing any form of sexual expression that cannot end in conception. But I think one thing that is going... Um, is making the right wing fervent right now, especially about all the issues of reproduction, is that in a very short time, this country is no longer going to be a majority white or European American country. And they're hyper aware of that. And they really you know, are constantly saying the white race is committing suicide. And there's this whole quiverful movement you know, that white kids should have as many children as possible. So generally speaking, you find that the same groups are against contraception and abortion, against um, immigration, because they see immigration as a source of non-white, uh, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it's usually the same forces. We're talking to feminist icon Gloria Steinem. She's just turned 80, and there's a hashtag name for her, WWGD. What would Gloria do? I ask her, coming up.
gathering There's again. an air of tension right now. The chanting for democracy. This is another significant development. We have an exclusive story tonight, and we go live. This is Talk to Al Jazeera. With us this week, Gloria Steinem. You are still a contributing editor at Ms. Magazine. Uh, recently, Beyonce was on the cover. Why is Beyonce a face of feminism to you? She's singing, she's out there, she's free, she's dancing. There are many faces of feminism, including Beyonce. I was part of her Chimes of Change concert um, in, in London, the proceeds of which went to fight violence against females around the world. And she kind of said to this audience that was two-thirds female, I know life is hard, I know it's difficult, but we are here together for an hour and you're safe. In 2008, you supported Hillary Clinton's bid uh, for president, and you argued in an op-ed, the sex barrier is not taken as seriously as the racial one. Is the feminist movement still taking a back seat to the civil rights movement? No, I don't think so. But the f feminist movement owes much of its existence to the civil rights movement, both the inspiration of the whole idea that we could be equal, people are human beings, a very contagious idea of freedom, and also uh, that because in the anti-Vietnam movement and in the civil rights movement, women were not altogether equal, as you can see in the marches when you know there were no women speaking and so on. Women began to realize, wait a minute, if even in these movements that matter to us so much and are so important, we're still not, <laughs> there needs to be an autonomous women's movement. So you saw these movements as growing together in concert yes, as opposed absolutely. to in opposition. No, most women in the world are not white women, at least, so they may experience some form of, of race discrimination as well as sex discrimination. Secondly, for men and women, if, if you want to defeat racism, you have to be a feminist because you have to free re reproduction. If you want to be a feminist, you have to be anti-racist because if there's racism, they're going to try to control <laughs> women's bodies and reproduction. These, these things are just inextricably intertwined. Um, meanwhile, Hillary Clinton looks like she could be the front runner to win the Democratic nomination if she chooses to run. When she lost the nomination in 2008, you said later you didn't expect she was going to win. No, I didn't. What are your expectations then for 2016? Well, now I think if she chooses to run, she might well win. I, I, I thought at the time that it was just too soon for any woman, or feminist woman at least, to, to win. Um, for a deep reason. I, I think that we are so accustomed to being raised by women, whether we're women or men, that we associate female authority with childhood, with emotion, with irrationality, with, you know, we don't associate it with public life and national governance. And she became Secretary of State. And, yeah, so she herself, as Secretary of State, has begun to change that as a public image of a woman in public, uh, not only national, but international authority. I, it was a very uh, difficult time, 2008, because they were both excellent candidates. <laughs> and for a whole year, people used to say to me, are you, are you supporting Obama or Hillary? And I would say, yes. You won the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2013, the highest civilian award in this country. Um, where does that rank among vindication for, and validation mm. for all of your work in the last 50 years? Well, um, it was 100% clear to me it was an award for a movement, and I accepted it in, in that spirit. Um, and it was also 100% clear that its meaning came from the person who gave it, which is President Obama. Actually, it has been given to some pretty terrible people in the past by other presidents, that, that Medal of Freedom, right? So, so it didn't rank that <laughs> high for you? No, well, no, it did because it came from President Obama. Right. But the award itself? Well, the award itself, no. I mean, it was given to Henry Hyde, who, whose amendment, whose uh, 
restriction of funds, federal funds for abortion has probably injured and killed more women than any other piece of legislation. And he got this award too. Isn't that ironic? Did you know that there's a hashtag on Twitter that was created around the time you turned 80? Um, hashtag WWGD. What would Gloria do? Someone told me that. <laughs> right. I, I, so, I thought so, I should ask myself, you know, gee, what would Gloria do? Maybe it would help me. I know? mean, I think that for a lot of women, you are still a compass. What would Gloria do in this and that situation? Do you feel that today as pressure or as praise? Um, Neither one. I, f I, I feel it as a kind of uh, interesting activist question, because I, what I take it to mean is, what would we do out of self-respect and a you know, real impulse towards equality and democracy in a particular situation? And I need to ask myself that. And I'm, if that's what it symbolizes to other people, I'm proud of that. Gloria Steinem, thank you so much for talking to Al Jazeera and for inviting us into your lovely home. No, thank you.